Tonight I want us to turn, if we will, to 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to start at verse number 40. And since we're, since we're going way back, I'm going to stay with King James. You know, as many of you know, I like kind of researching some of the different, different uh, translations. But tonight we're going to stay with King James, uh, at least for now. We may venture off somewhere along the way. Chapter 17, verse 40. And he took his staff in his hand, and he chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. He put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David. And the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about, he saw David, and he disdained him. He disrespected him. Uh, as the young folks say, he dissed him, okay? He, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of fair countenance. And the Philistines said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistines said to David, Come to me, and I'll give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beast of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, with a spear, with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. Amen. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and, will, and I will smite thee, and I will take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines. Now see, by now David's starting to feel the anointing. He's starting to be emboldened. You know, at first this giant of a man, his enemy was, was speaking bold things and he says, I'm going to feed you to the fowls of there. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feed your carcass to the buzzards. But now the anointing, you can tell when the anointing came on, right? So now David's starting to trash talk a little bit. He says, I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna do this. The Lord's going to deliver you into my hand. He acknowledged where the power is coming from. Now, instead of him saying, I'm going to feed you to the buzzards, he's saying, I will smite. I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to take your head off of you, and I'm going to give the carcasses of all, all your armies, all the host of the Philistines this day, to the fowls of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there's a God in Israel. And I want to point out, that I, I, I'm meant to just read straight through this while you're standing, but that's okay, I'm going to be standing, so you can stand for a little bit. There's a reason God does miracles in our life. He don't do it just to put on a show. You know, sometimes we misunderstand what a miracle is all about. So David's trash talking, but then he comes back down and he explains why God's going to do this. That all the earth may know that there's a God in Israel. You see, God wants to do some great things in your life, but not just to, not, not just to entertain you. He wants to do it to prove his power so he can be a witness to others through your life. Amen? There's a reason we go through these things. We go so God can be God, not just in our lives, but in the lives of those in our circle of influence. Didn't mean to say that right there, but somebody needed it. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saves not with the sword and the spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. I'm going to stop right there, too. He says the battle is the Lord's. We read that, and we think we just sit back, and God fights the battle. We have a misunderstanding in our modern day of what a miracle is all about. For the battle is the Lord's, and we stop. We put a period, but there's only a comma. It says, and he will deliver you into our hands. You see, we're still doing something. We're not sitting back watching God do it, but God's doing it through us. Amen? 
It came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David that David hasted. He ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag. He took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in the forehead. And the stone sunk into his forehead. He fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling, with a stone. He smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Lord Jesus, we love you tonight, God. We thank you for your powerful word, God. We ask that you anoint our hearts, God, to receive what you have for us tonight, God. Lord, that our lives would be changed. Lord, that, that someone would leave here encouraged by your word tonight, God. Lord, that we would go forth into victory in the name of the Lord Jesus. Why don't we give him a hand tonight? Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. You may be seated. And so I'm going to go back to that old title, Victory in the Valley. How many, I, I hate to ask for a show of hands, but I know you've been going through a valley. Amen. You know I've gone through some valleys. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, hang tight and you will. You see, life consists of mountaintop experiences and valley experiences. And sometimes we dread those valleys. Sometimes we dread those times that we go through that, that we're not shouting. Sometimes we're not feeling like we're on top of the world. You see, we're, if you go all the way back to verse 3... It says, the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley in between them. Maybe that's why we dislike valleys is because we know that that's where battles take place. And so the armies were camped up on the mountains. A mountain's a good place. How many has ever been on a mountain before? Amen. Yeah. Yeah, I got to travel to some, not, not real high mountains, not like the ones that you have to climb up with ropes and stuff, but the kind you can drive up on top of. And I enjoyed that. Went out to Colorado, went out to California, drove to the top of those mountains. I'm not interested in when I have to get out of my car. But I've been on top of those mountains, been out there on the Continental Divide. You stand up there on top of that mountain and... It's a beautiful thing. You, you can see for miles. You look back where you came from, and you can see that winding road up the side of the mountain. And maybe you see a car or even an 18-wheeler, and it looks so tiny in the distance. And you remember that that was several hours ago that you traveled on that little bit of road. And then you look to the sides, and you, you have great perspective of where you are. You look where you're going, the way you're going to be leaving, and you, and you, you have a, a great, great vision. And that's important because the Bible says without vision, people perish. And so we want to have a vision. We need the mountaintop experiences. We need those times when it feels like nothing can go wrong, like we're on top of the world. But what happens if you stay on top of that mountain? You're going to starve to death because, you know, I didn't see any crops growing up there. It gets kind of cold at night on top of that mountain. And so we learned that it's a great place to go visit. It's a great place to be because we, we gain vision. We gain perspective. But we can't live on that mountain. We want to be there every once in a while so we can keep a keen awareness of what God has for us and where God's brought us from and where God's bringing us to. And, and all the English professors just, just had uh, heart attacks because of my use of the prepositions. But a mountaintop is important. But then we have to go through the valley because you see this one army was over here on this mountain, this other army was on this other mountain and there was a fight going to take place and so somebody had to get down off the mountain 
And you know, you, there's, there's a fight that's going to take place. If you're not in the middle of it now, just hang on. It's going to happen. And when you go through that valley, you have to remember what you saw on the mountain. Because when you're, when you're in the valley, when you're in the thick of it, you don't see very far. So you have to trust. And I remember reading in the Word something about walking by faith and not by sight. And so we're in that valley, and we can't see what God has for us. We have to believe what God has for us. Uh, we don't even know how much longer we're going to be in the valley because there's so much in between us and the next mountaintop that we just, we know that it's up there. We can look over the, over the growth, and we can see the top of a mountain in the distance, but we just have no idea how long we're going to be in that valley. But there's something else I noticed about a valley. Over the years, I had the privilege of being in a couple of valleys in this natural world. Out in, out in Texas, you've got the Rio Grande Valley. Out in California, you've got the San Joaquin Valley. And the first thing that you'll notice about a valley is its rich soil and, and fruit and vegetables just grow plentifully in the valley. If you want to go to, to the store and you get some grapes, those grapes were grown in a valley. If you go and you get some oranges, those oranges were grown in a valley. All of your best fruit and vegetables come from a valley. And the fruit of the Spirit in your life is going to grow when you go through the valley. And you want to mature in God, you're going to grow in your walk with Him when you go through the valley. And I don't like valleys. I don't, I'm talking in the spiritual sense now. I don't like walk, going through times when I, I like being on top of the world. But when I look back at what, where God's brought me, I've grown the most in the valley. And the other thing that takes place in a valley, that's where the battles are fought, is in the valley. I don't remember, and there may be cases. I, 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 you know, I'm not claiming to have a, an extensive knowledge of world history, but I don't remember reading about any great major battles that took place on the top of a mountain. Now, let's see what brought David to this place. He didn't just one day wake up and say, hmm, I'm going to go fight a giant today. But there was some background. There was some preparation. There was some other battles that came along. As a matter of fact, before we read about any of the battles that took place in David's life, we read about an event in the previous chapter. And, and he may have already had some of these battles by then that, that took place. But we read about something called the anointing. How many want God to anoint your life? How many want the power of God to anoint your life? Amen? You see, in the previous chapter, the prophet had come out to, to Jesse's house, Jesse being David's father, and, and said, one of your sons, God, God's told me that one of your sons is going to be the next king of Israel. And all of the sons came, and David being the youngest, he was the last to come before the prophet. And the prophet anointed him to be king of Israel. Now David is going on to the battlefield knowing that God has more for him in his life than where he is now. You see, if God's not through with you, what you're going through now ain't going to kill you. Amen. Amen. If he's, got, if he's anointed you to do more than you've done, you know, I heard someone say one time, it's going to be all right in the end. It's not all right, so it's not the end. Amen? Sometimes we look at that current battle we're in, we look at that current struggle, and we think, well, maybe this is it. I don't know if I can do this. Well, if God brought you, and, and I'm full of cliches tonight, but if God brought you to it, he'll bring you through it. Amen? Amen? He didn't bring you this far to just back off and let go. 
So David had an anointing. He also had experience. You see, he, he fought other battles. He fought, we might say smaller battles, but I don't know. The, the Bible says he had experience of fighting a lion and fighting a bear. Now, I don't know. That'd have to be a mighty big guy for me to choose that lion over him or that bear over him. So David had already experienced the anointing of God, the power of God, what God could do in his life, how God could bring him through those battles into victory. Now, we, we and I'm getting ahead of myself, but we, we love talking about living a victorious life. All, all you radio preachers talk about walking in victory. Well, let me tell you something. If, if you're walking in victory, the bigger the victory means the bigger the battle. So if you're wanting victory, what you're doing is you're actually asking for another battle. Because it's impossible for God to just lay victory in your lap without you going through that battle. See, there's a process to get you to the end product. We want the product, but we don't want the process. And I said we, I didn't say you. I'm in there too. But we know that to get what God has, we got to go through what we're going through. Amen? So d during everything that David went through, you see what he faced yesterday prepared him for today. And maybe what you're facing today is preparing you for tomorrow. Because you went through something yesterday that prepared you for what you went through today. And today is probably not the biggest battle you're going to fight. But you see, when you get to that other battle, you're going to be more prepared for it. And when we go through that battle, that's just a vote of confidence that God knows we've got that. Amen? Because he's prepared us for it. He's anointed us for it. Amen? Our previous experience in our walk with him has prepared us for what we're going through today. He had developed two traits. One, faith. Boy, this is real profound. But you see, faith, the Bible talks about moving mountains. But Hebrews 11 says that faith is the substance. Substance? But faith is kind of like wishing, right? No. Faith is when you know that God can do it. You know that God can. How many remember God can? Well, you know, he still can. Sometimes when we go through what we go through, we kind of forget that God can. But that's faith. You see, faith is the substance of something that we hoped for. But the Bible doesn't stop there. It says it's the evidence. It's the proof of something that we don't yet see. David had developed faith but even more than faith, he had developed faithfulness. He had developed faithfulness. Now, I'd love to say that faithfulness isn't that big a deal, but I'm going to let you know faithfulness is everything. Faithfulness is everything. We might not shout about faithfulness. Now, if we talk about the, the spiritual gifts operating in the middle of us and the word of prophecy is going to come forth and, 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 and God's going to heal folks and they're going to get out of wheelchairs, we can get excited. But if we talk about being faithful, it's hard for us to get excited about that. But, you know, if we turn to the end of the book, if we turn to the book of Revelation... If we turn all the way to the back, there's some folks that's there with Jesus in the end, that's there in heaven with Jesus. And the Bible said these folks are the called. Hey, has God called you? Amen. The chosen. <laughs> hallelujah. And the faithful. You see, God can call you. He can choose you. But only you can be faithful. So you have control of your own destiny. Faithfulness. Doesn't say it was the folks there that were used in the spiritual gifts. It doesn't say it was the folks that could preach good or sing good or, or, or had all these talents. The called, the chosen, the faithful. 
That's what David developed. Now, I'm going to shift gears here a little bit and go over to the New Living Translation. I'm going to read verse number 25. David had some motivation for moving into that valley. Verse 25, New Living Translation. This was the conversation that was being had among the soldiers, and David's ears perked up. He says, it says, have you seen the giant? He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He will give that man one of his daughters. Oh, going to get a reward? Get to marry a princess? one of the king's daughters, as a wife, and the man's entire family will be exempt from taxes. Now, if we read that, and maybe, maybe you read over that, but that kind of sounds like an odd motivation for David. But you know, we have a similar motivation because there's a reward to living for God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, King James says, But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. And so the first reason why you want to face your giant is because there's a reward involved. You get to marry a princess. You get to be rich. Eye has not seen. Ear has not heard. Now, I've got a pretty big imagination. How many believe I've got a good imagination? How many of you have a good imagination? I can imagine stuff, folks. Jesus said that we have to be like children. Children have a big imagination. I've told you about some of the things I imagined as a child, and you have probably imagined some of the same things or maybe even more crazy than that. I have sat in an apple box as a small child and, and held a saucer in my hand as a steering wheel, and I have won the Indianapolis 500 multiple times and by multiple laps ahead of the other competitors. That's the imagination of a child. I took that apple box and I added two small uh, little flat boxes like the little canned goods come on and made wings and I actually fought in a dog fight and beat the Red Baron. Now don't tell me you didn't have an imagination like that as a child because I know better. This verse says, neither has it entered into the heart of man. So no matter how big you can imagine, God has a better reward for you than that. Does that make sense? So the first part of David's motivation was a reward, but the second part was a mission. In the 29th verse, David said, is there not a cause at the very last thing that Jesus told his disciples after he had been resurrected, we refer to it as the Great Commission, where he told them to go into all the world and spread the gospel. There was a mission. During Jesus' life, he only gave one prayer request. Only one prayer request Jesus ever gave. Now, I'm going to tell you, I've had some prayer requests before. In Luke 10, verse 2, he said unto them, The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. That's how important this mission is. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about the battle itself. Man, it's quiet in here. You know, I try not to preach for, a, for a, a response from the crowd, but why don't we just give the Lord a hand right now? Lord Jesus, thank you, God. Hallelujah. I hope it's been quiet because you're listening, not because I'm boring. <laughs> Amen. Go back to that 40th verse. It says, and he took his staff in his hand. So let's, let's look at the tools that he used in this battle. He had a staff, 
chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, put them in a shepherd's bag, and he had a sling in his hand. So what was that staff all about? When we, when we read our scripture, Goliath said, you're coming at me with a stick. See, that staff wasn't even part of the weaponry. All that staff was, that, that was, that was a staff that was just used for stability. Just like anyone walking in rough terrain has, has the, their staff that they use. I, I, I know hikers use, use a staff. And shepherds were known for having a shepherd's staff. Uh, you know, in all the Christmas plays, it has a big crook on the end. But I don't know if the shepherd's staff had a crook on the end or not. But it was a longer rod, a longer pole. And it was used for stability, which means faithfulness. God wants us to be stable. God wants us to be mature in our walk with him. He doesn't want us to go through life living for him year after year and still be at that starting point and still be children in our walk with him. He wants us to grow. He talks about, don't, Paul wrote about not having to be sustained with the milk of the word, but, but being able to move on to the meat of the word of God. And there's some folks that their spiritual life is stunted and they're always at that point of being being just barely struggling along and and I pray that each of us would mature to that point that we're a strength to others instead of always struggling and straining in our walk with God is that okay amen and you get that by faithfulness to him because when you're faithful to him, you see the power of God working in your life over and over. And now you have a track record to fall back on. Well, I remember when I was going through this, God was there for me. And I remember when I went through that, God was there for me. And, and when it seemed like there was no way out and, and when the doctor said there was no hope, God did this work in my life. And so I'm going to be faithful to him today and I'm going to trust him and I'm going to believe him even when it seems impossible. You see, if you go back and read the account of this chapter and you read it in some of the other translations, King James doesn't translate the word this way, but some of them translate what King Saul told David when he came to him and said he wanted to fight Goliath. The king told him, that is ridiculous. You see, faith means standing solid on what everybody else says is ridiculous. Amen. Miracles always are ridiculous until they happen. Victory is always ridiculous until it happens. Amen. Faith is the substance, it's the evidence. It's ridiculous because we can't see it. The world says seeing is believing. God says you just believe it and I'll take care of what you see. So he had that staff there. He was, he was just, all he was doing is keeping a firm foundation. All he was doing is just walking solid. Amen? Now, a lot of times this staff's confused with a rod. Psalm 23 says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You see, a shepherd also carried a rod, and all that was was a, a shorter, thicker stick that was a club. And that's what the shepherd would use to fight off predators from the sheep in close range. He'd use a sling at a distance, and he'd use his rod up close. But this was just a staff, and God wants faithfulness in our lives. The other thing that... that that is mentioned in that verse are the stones. He reached into the brook and he pulled out five smooth stones. It only took one stone, but God is, is always going to provide us more than enough. Amen? It, and what, what is that stone representing? I believe in the New Testament, Jesus said, in, in the account in Matthew 16, Jesus asked his disciples, who, who do people say that I am? Uh, uh, or who do you say I am? Peter spoke up and he said, well, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you. Flesh and blood hadn't shown that to you, but he goes on in verse eight. He says, I say unto you, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church. 
The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What rock was he talking about? He wasn't talking about uh, Peter. He was talking about the rock of the revelation of who God was. And we could stop here and we could talk how, how God is one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. But that's not where I'm going. Sometimes we just need to understand who God is. We need to understand the power of God that wants to work in our lives. You know, well, I, I'm living for God, but I'm going through all the same stuff everybody else in the world is. Well, we do, but our response to it don't have to be like everybody else's. Amen? We can, we can fight that battle with God backing us up. Amen? So when we have that revelation of who he is, then he will be our weapon. We will realize that he has all power. He said, all power is given unto me. If all power is given to Jesus, what other power is there? We will realize there's nothing too big for him. You see, what was happening here, everybody else, everybody else in the crowd was comparing them, Goliath to themselves. All the other soldiers, Saul, Saul the king included, they were looking at him. This dude's around nine feet tall. You know, some accounts say nine, some say ten. He was a big dude. Man, somebody, I mean, I mean, this guy here is six foot tall, and I think he's a giant, you know. I mean, nine feet tall. The problem was they were comparing themselves. You know what David did? David was comparing Goliath to God. When you put him up beside God, then he was small. Then he was tiny. Then he was insignificant. Now, I'm going to do something here for a moment. I'm, I'm going to ask a, a, a question, and this is important. This, this tablet, which hopefully will come back on when I open it back up. This tablet, what's bigger, it or that drum cage? A anybody? The drum cage is bigger. So if, if I let this represent my problem, if I let this represent my battle, if I let this represent my Goliath, if I let this represent the giant in my life, and I let the drum cage represent God in my life, and, and it's really a bigger difference than that, but, but I have to do something for an illustration. Now, sometimes we don't see that God is bigger than our problem. And there's two reasons that could happen. One, we're over here looking at, we're walking away from God and we're looking at our problem. We're looking at our battle. And God's off over there somewhere where we left him. The other thing is maybe we're doing all we can to make our way toward God, but we've just let that problem engulf everything in our lives and our entire vision. And how many believe that I can see the drum cage? Or how many know that I can't? You see, we can get so close to our problem where it engulfs our entire, our entire vision. And we can't even see God right there before us trying to do his work in our lives because we've got him blocked with our problems, with our battles, with our circumstances of life. Amen? Well, where did he get the stones? Better call for some musicians. I may go all night. That'll, you know, they start playing and that'll kind of rush me up so that I'll hush. But he got his armament, he got his ammo out of the brook. Now the Bible compares the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, to living water. And I want to let the Spirit of God flow over my life. And we talked about the rock being the rocks of revelation, of knowing who God is and knowing who his power is, understanding the word of God and the power of God. But you see, it has to be tempered by the spirit of God flowing over it because it was five smooth stones. And you know, God cuts the rough edges off when the smooths, he smooths it out. 
by the flowing of the Holy Ghost through our lives. And the Lord knows I have plenty of rough edges that he has to constantly smooth by the flowing of his spirit in my life. Does that make sense? Amen. Now, by the way, how many understand the law of gravity that water is going to go to the lowest point? So let's make a side note here that where that brook was flowing was the lowest point in David's valley. If we avoid the valley, if we run from the battle, we'll never get to that low point where the Spirit of God can sweep over us. If we're scared of letting God do his work in our lives, then the giant's going to cross over and we're not going to have those five smooth stones in our lives. What did he do with those other four stones? He put them in his bag. He had a little man purse, a little fanny pack. We put the word of God in our heart. Thy word, O oh Lord, have I hid in my heart. You see, when you come to church on Wednesday night, there's two things you're supposed to get here tonight. You're supposed to get a blessing while you're here. In a moment, I'm going to shut up, and I'm going to ask you to come up here, and God's going to touch you. See, it's okay for me to talk about me shutting up. I'm not going to tell you to shut up. I'm going to say, oh, let's just be a little, a little calmer. Hey. But I'm going to hush in a minute, and God's going to do a work in your life when you come forward and let your brothers and your sisters pray with you, and the power of God's going to work in your life. How many have a need here tonight? Seriously, how many came here with a need in your life? Amen. Whether it's a physical need, a spiritual need, every one of you, whether you raised your hands or not, if you came here and you have a need that you can identify, I need God to do this in my life. I know it's just midweek, but I want you to make your way to the front, and I want you to grab a hold of someone and say, pray for me, and I believe God's going to do that work. How many is going to believe with me God's going to do that work in your life? Amen? The second thing that's going to happen tonight, God's going to help you to put some of that in your heart. You're going to take it with you. And you're going to go out into the world tomorrow instead of, it, instead of it dragging you down and the system of this world dragging you down. You're going to light your world. You're going to spread some of what you put in that, in that bag and you put it in your heart. Amen? And then the final thing that he took with him was that sling. Wasn't no slingshot like this. It was that big kind. He... He was able to zing that rock because he had, it, he had it going on. And you see, when the anointing is in your life, it's more than just what you could do just throwing. Oh, but that anointing's a hold of you now. Now the power of God, you're going to zing it out there against the, the enemy. Amen. One place we read said, And the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. You see, the gates of a city were the last stand. When an army comes against, when, when an army comes against a city, when the gates give way, the battle's over. It's, it's all over once the gates give way. And sometimes we go through life, why don't we stand to our feet? Sometimes we go through life saying, oh, the devil's been after me. Oh, it's hard. And maybe it is, okay? I'm not, I'm not downgrading that. But where God wants you to be when you're walking in victory, when you've, when you've realized you've got to face that battle, and God's going God's gonna to give you power and anointing through that battle, but you're going to have to face. You don't even get to pick what battles. That, that battle came to David. God has anointing for you. God has power that he wants to endow upon your life. How many want to believe God with me for that tonight? He don't want you to go through life struggling. He don't want you to go through life just hoping you can make it till Sunday to come be in the presence of God. But he wants you to take the presence of God with you into this world and let it overflow onto others. Amen? Hallelujah. Anybody wants God to touch them? I want all of us to make it to the front, but I, I'm going to separate it. And I'm going to say, if you've got a need, 
that you want to be prayed for tonight, I want you to come first. It can be a spiritual need. It can be a physical healing. Whatever it is you need. I want some of these some of these other folks up here that's, that, 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 that are not coming for prayer to join you. So now why don't the whole church make their way? Amen. Hallelujah. I believe God has something for you if you came here for it tonight. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's all pray for a while. Thank you, Jesus. Thanks for joining our online worship experience. We hope it has been a blessing to you and your family. We would love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, or you can go to www.point.church and connect with us there. If you'd like to partner with us in giving, you could download our app, or you could go to point.church and click give. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to worshiping with you again soon.